Uh, my name is Bram Wessel. Thank you all for coming, and uh, let's let's get started. So, so I just wanted to to kind of uh, frame the conversation a little bit. We're going to be talking about research, and I think most of the people in this room probably have a pretty good, you know, idea in their minds about what design research is, right? Yeah. Um, so you might picture, you know, a uh, somebody puzzling their way through uh, a prototype. Uh, maybe doing a think out loud protocol, um, you know, trying when their research is trying to really understand, you know, what's motivating them, what's uh, going on in their minds. Um, but uh, I think I think you probably have a deeper <laughs> understanding of this than most of us do because I don't know if it's deeper, you, it might be older. <laughs> yeah, because you kind of started this. So 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 where do you think it really really begins? Well, I want to uh, I want to first say thank you so much for hosting me. This is a blast, and I've met so many interesting people already. Thank you. Um, so when Brandon and I first talked about this, I I tried to make the point that I wanted to talk about generative design research. Um, there's a difference between generative and formative, as we know. And so, for me, where generative research starts is, I guess having care for a particular audience, group of people, um, having the goal to, thank you, to, oh. en to enhance the good in our world. Yeah, hold it closer. Yeah. These mics don't pick up that well. Okay. <laughs> um, but sometimes a design, generative design research also starts with a new technology or a new opportunity space in the market. So those things tend to be generators of questions that we can answer in the generative phase. And let me say what I mean by that is that thing we all wish we could do all the time, which is to figure out what to make instead of how to make it, right? So. Yeah, and what, what questions we should be asking, right. you know, to, you know in, in the beginning so that we're researching the right things. Yeah. 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 So what what does it really consist of in your in your mind and and as you sort of practice it? And by the way, we have a we have a discussion guide. If you didn't use a research, you might have yes. a discussion guide. But we're we're hoping that we go off script quite a bit. So. Right. <laughs> well, I think there are a lot of different skills that we bring to bear in generative research. Um, um maybe the most important, in my view, is the ability to do rigorous self-examination to understand what your values are, what your biases are, um, and to deploy those appropriately. So what we want to do is, even with our values, hang these things up at the door while we're doing the human-centered piece of research. We don't want to poison our results by saying, as, as was the case with all the games for, for tween girls. Uh, little girls are, should be nice. They're always nice to each other. Or girls in their fantasy dream world want to take care of animals and nurture things. Right? If we had gone with those sorts of biases, we would have gotten it completely wrong. Um, so self-examination, the ability to call yourself out and to suspend, if you will, those qualities until you get into a later stage of research. That's something that's really important. I think that um, the goal of generative research is probably informed intuition. So that imagination and creativity are part of how you get that informed intuition. But certainly the most important thing, I think, is human-centered research. And that is going out, talking to people, meeting them where they are. Right. Yeah, and, and what you mentioned uh, that that you know that informed um, what did you say? Informed intuition. Informed intuition, right, right. Uh, informed intuition, that's that's kind of a principle. What are some of the other principles? Well, let me see. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say here? Uh, <laughs> well we did one one way into that is that during the salon yeah. We talked. We actually framed the salon around some of these principles. Oh, okay. I, I see where you're going. So, <laughs> <laughs> so certainly, um, 
it's become clearer and more important to me in my long and crusty career that designing for the good is really important. Um, that can mean different things to different people, but designing just to make money is not a useful idea. And I'm speaking as a 25-year veteran of the computer game business. Okay, so that can't be our first goal. I think, if anything, I've become more of a stoic as I get older. And that is to say, it's our job to model good behavior, civility, care. Right. So to me, that's that's a frame of mind that we need that we need to have. And in terms of designing for people who aren't ourselves care for that audience, really deciding that these people are worth paying attention to that we're designing for. So for example, I've done generative research on designing for six-year-old boys and tween girls and elders and, and um, institutional care. So there has to be a connection in your heart, I think, with, with the people that you think you want to design something for. Um, and this business of new technologies and opportunity spaces is coming up all the time. The problem is that you get a new technology, new quote unquote, yeah. like virtual reality, which I worked in it since 1987, um, <laughs> that when it, when it re-emerged, um, the immediate thought was, well, this is, this is a medium for games, right? This technology is for games. And most of what got developed early on in this new phase of VR's life has been gaming. That's, that's revealing of an opportunity space, for one thing. Because there's a whole lot more you can do with VR than play games. And in fact, you can't play games so very well in VR a lot of the time, right? So another opportunity space is aging boomers. Just a demographic one, where we have people my age and older now starting to get on social security and go into institutional care, which I'm not yet. Uh, hope not to be. <laughs> so I hope that helps. Yeah. I, so one of the things that we've been we've been talking about in our conversation leading up to this is is um, framing uh, the questions that that are the good questions to ask when you start doing research. So what are some strategies for getting outside of that box of that formal method, you know, the, the, you know, the think alouds, the contextual inquiry, and really defining the lens of inquiry before starting the formal research? Well, one of the things uh, we developed at Art Center that I've used in my teaching ever since was this notion of uh, naming three terms, three little words as an approach to generative research. Um, so for example, at Art Center we used energy, entitlement, and brand as one of those three little words. This is right after uh, September 11th. We used media messages, social intelligence, and manliness in our examinations for six-year-old boys. So if you notice, one of those three terms is usually kind of a rub with the other two like energy entitlement brand, what, what brand? Uh, social intelligence, media messages, and manliness. One of those is kind of rubbing with the others, it seems to me. And that's social intelligence. Um, when we looked at math anxiety at UC Santa Cruz, I gave them anxiety, math, and delight. So there was a rub in there. And it was great because the students in that class were game design students. They ended up addressing math anxiety in sixth graders um, by going through the whole process. So that's one way to get started, mm -hmm. one way to frame. Yeah. Yeah, and it also uh, starts to, to get into values um, or, you know, sort of the set of uh, values that make up a philosophy. Uh, so. What do you see as that sort of driving philosophy um, that, you know, that really informs the how that we do it, um, or the values behind research as you, as, as you have practiced it or envision it being practiced? Oh, okay. Well, I think, first of all, meeting people where they are is really important. 
That is, you can't address the idealized or stereotypical version of whoever you think your audience is. Um, but actually, if we look, so something I really dislike about IDEO. <laughs> she, she said IDEO, not artifact. <laughs> Three syllables, different agencies. Different, although they both start with vowels, but they're different. Um, IDEO talks about um, finding the pain. Right? Finding the pain point. It's like you've got somebody going, does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does yeah. that hurt? You know, it's like, well, so need finding, pain finding is only a tiny piece of the picture. Delight finding, joy finding, you know, augmentation finding. These these are pieces of the of the puzzle too. And I think as an industry we get we get into a trap of seeing delight as a, I was going to say artifact. <laughs> delight as, you know, an also ran piece of, of what you're doing. When in fact it could be your main goal is to help people take delight in their lives, to take delight in a particular task. So I guess those are some things that I think are canonical. And as I said, the whole stoic notion that we as citizens, as people, professionals and elders kind of have the job in a good civil society of modeling the good for others, even if that means doing it through negative means, right? So you, you paint a negative picture of climate change with a piece like tree in virtual reality. I think they should have given users more interactive choices there, but it, you know, it ends with slash and burn fires in the jungle. Um, there's a an experience that's given that's delightful and at the same time deeply intimately painful um, that brings a message forward that people need to hear, I think. Is that helpful? Yeah, yeah. So getting more into the how um, and the skills that we need to, to be able to do this successfully and to be able to get outside of our frame, um, what are some of the modes of thought that we need to inhabit? Uh, when you know when while we're using what we've generated through research, then to start working that design problem. Right. So. Hey, <laughs> sure. Aww. That's See sweet. if that works because I can project. I can too. Sometimes <laughs> when I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Thanks for making Thank you, me sir, think yeah. about it. So this bias business, uh, you know, that self-examination is important. We had a bias box in a lot of my classes in design research where we would ask people to write down their biases about the word cluster or the audience. And then we would either put them in a box or sometimes we would burn them in my tiny cauldron. <laughs> but putting them in a box is good because that means you can take them back out later and laugh at yourself uh, when, when the world has proven you uh, inaccurate in some of your judgments. Um, and the same thing goes with values. It's, it's really hard and interesting. It, you're, you're kind of doing a split brain experiment with yourself in that, um, you know, you do something because you care about this population. I care about six-year-old boys. I care about what they're learning about their manhood and their masculinity. But at the same time, I can't let that color the questions that I ask or how I interpret the answers, you know. So the values need to be hung at the door during the human-centered research part. And then you bring them back in, in the synthesis piece of, of, of the activity. So we're going to talk about synthesis analysis and synthesis in a minute. I think there are a couple other things. Thinking strategically. Our uh, let me give you an example. Repurposing existing logistics, like the cell phone network, like GPS, right? That, that, that kind of systematic, strategic, tactical, logistical thinking can really get you somewhere uh, when you're doing generative research. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So how universal is this? Um, does this vary, you know, from academic to professional environments? Why, yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> what, 
Um, and not necessarily, but you know, we'll talk about some institutional resistances later, which I'm sure you do not have here at Artifact. Um, typically, in the professional environment, we're looking at formative research. Somebody has, maybe a market researcher has decided that there's a market opportunity and they know exactly what to do and your job is to go out there and make it and make it pleasant if you can, right? And, and I'm exaggerating, but not by a lot. Um, one of the biggest battles we fight as researchers is getting corporations or clients to believe it's worth the money to spend on generative research and not just beta testing. I'm saying, so am I? Am I getting to what you want me to talk about? <laughs> you can talk about whatever you want to talk oh, about. Oh dear! Oh dear! <laughs> so, um, in academic environments, it's much easier to do generative research, obviously, because you're at the same. T your goal is edu the education or the collaborative learning of yourself with your class, and nobody's saying. How can I monetize this? What's distribution going to look like, et cetera? So you've got more runway, um, and you've got a bunch of eager young minds who are doing all kinds of imaginative things that we might not think of in the more professional um, neighborhoods of design research. Do you think as a, as a profession or as a discipline, actually, more accurately, because I just, I just totally crossed the blood brain barrier of academic versus professional, but um, <laughs> as a discipline, uh, are we still learning, you know, what, what our sort of core principles are? Oh, absolutely. I think, I think we're learning that all the time. Um, for example, this business of stoicism has come up a lot for me just because of the decay of civil discourse yeah. in our society and the urgency uh, that a lot of these issues present to us. So the ground is changing underneath us as society changes, as culture changes. And so the methods that we get to use appear. Um, the use of probes is something that I've seen develop a lot over the last 20 years. And a probe is something that you might give to somebody you're going to interview ahead of time or during the interview, or you might send it to them at home. So that as a design skill in and of itself is something that's coming online. And I, I think it's just because we figured out how good it is, you know, how useful mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What, are there some other examples? Uh, you talked about the bias box, uh, you talked about probes. Uh, some other examples of sort of uncommon approaches that you've engaged in? Yeah, well, I'll give you one from the research some of my students did on baby boomers. We were looking at baby boomers and political engagement in a time when they were not voting very much uh, <laughs> as, a, as a percentage of the demographic. And the students curated movies and television shows that boomers had watched in their youth so that we could begin to form a, a notion of what justice looked like, what government looked like, what individuality and action looked like. And the finding there was overwhelmingly that the individualistic, I am the law kind of hero was what these folks were exposed to more than anything. Um, so Clint Eastwood, right? Um, even the Kung Fu television series was that way. Um, so this colors then how you begin to understand political participation from that demographic. I thought that was brilliant of the students. So they kept torturing me by starting classes with Logan's Run because they knew I hated it. <laughs> so that would come up like every other week, but yeah. I got my Star Trek too. <laughs> well, let's, let's get into talking about uh, synthesis. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, the analytical phase of, mm -hmm. of research. So once we've gathered our observations, you know, what happened, what did we, what did we see, mm -hmm. uh, and consolidated them into some findings, uh, some, uh, some, you know, things that we can concretely say that happen typically, maybe, um, how do we go about transforming those into insights and implications, or maybe even 
to get all Hegelian hypotheses. Oh dear. Yeah. Uh, let me back up. I think, first of all, that analysis and synthesis are the two least well understood mm. phases of design research, and that often will jump from data to insight. Mm. Seems to me that everybody was saying blah blah blah, right? So. The analysis phase is incredibly important. That means basically you're looking for patterns in the data. You're throwing it at the wall every way to Sunday until you start to see patterns. So you can use visualization methods that we're all familiar with. You can use you can also use installations. I I had students in a research project on tweens and technology um, build installations that represented the different vibrations that they were seeing in the patterns of the data, ways of moods, ways of being that these kids had. Now I'm in the synthesis, but <laughs> and they, uh, um, a lot of the time you can use the same tools in analysis and synthesis, but building personas is another one where I have two rules about that. One is that a persona has to be based on subject prime, a person, somebody, right? a person whom you have interviewed. Uh, you can then look at aggregates of people who are kind of like that, but you don't make them up. You don't make them up out of whole cloth. Um, and putting scenarios together about how an activity might unfold, um, my rule there is there's got to be a failure in, in every good scenario. Mm. Something has to break. The person can't figure out what to do or the technology behaves in an unexpected way. And then we need to see how both the system and the interactor recover from that failure. That's just good drama and good storytelling, but it also gives us the opportunity to ask that question. How is this going to break? You know, what could somebody possibly do wrong? I have a story. Can I tell a consultant Oh, yeah, story? please do. So years ago, a uh, way long time ago, I was working uh, as a, an interaction consultant, and uh, an outfit called Homestead, which was a website building company early days, asked me to come evaluate their system. Well, I tried it at home, and it crashed immediately. First key press, crashed. And it took me a while to figure out what was wrong. And they were showing black type on a black field. <laughs> <laughs> so I was clicking all around, and uh, when I came in for the session, I said, uh, I'll tell you what. I can bring this thing down in one click. No, you can't. How about if you double my salary if I do? <laughs> and then I did. <laughs> they said, you know, and their response was, nobody would do that. Well, nobody would put black type on a black field either. You know, so that's why it's important to have failure modes in scenarios. <laughs> yeah, it's not just the, the happy path. Right. Or, so when you when you get when you've seen your patterns and you've been able to represent the patterns that you've seen to yourself in whatever way, then is the time to say, okay, we're gonna call these findings these patterns. And then the synthesis piece is really turning those findings into design heuristics. Right. So if I'm going to build X, then I know that I should not do that or I should do this. So for example, when I was working on games for little girls, we learned that if you have a clock and a score, you are screwed. Heuristic. Do not do it in a game for a little girl. Now, this was in the early 90s, so, you know, it's changed, I'm sure. But that's how we get from analysis to synthesis. Right. It's That's that's how, you know, we validate the hypothesis and then transform it into something actionable, something that can actually be designed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like you said. <laughs> Academically. <laughs> uh, I, knew, I knew that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> so, so what are some of the roadblocks that occur when we uh, attempt this sort of synthesis, uh, to synthesize our hypotheses into more concrete design outcomes? Yeah. <clears throat> well, as I said before, there's institutional resistance from many companies. I can remember being called in to consult on games for girls at Sony. <laughs> there were like six guys there and they were all asleep. Uh, they weren't listening. 
they weren't interested in research, not even hearing about research I'd already done on the demographic, you know. My students tell me all the time who my graduates who are out working professionally that they have a hard sell job to do when they're trying to sell design research to a company or a client. Nobody wants to spend the time and nobody wants to spend the money. So you have to be able to talk about the upside and give positive examples of how it's worked um, in order to sell the notion sometimes to companies. Another roadblock I think is the one I mentioned before is this idée fixe about what a particular medium is good for. So the example was VR is for games, right? Our spreadsheets are for managing numbers. You know, that's a not a medium, that's a genre. But God, I can do anything with Excel. You know, it's really fun. Um, so those those kind of biases about platforms and media types. What I'm seeing today in in my life in virtual reality, as it were, is ignorance of what's happened in the past. You know, the, a lot of people who are still doing point and teleport with a vibe do not know that people have solved the locomotion problem in a variety of ways, right? People who are frying your eyeballs with super high resolution action games do not know what we've learned about the power of ambiguity in creating engagement. I mean, if they'd read McLuhan, they might know that, but they haven't. Um, so there's, there's just this sort of dismissal, I think, of people who've worked in the field before that I, I get sort of delighted by sometimes and I'm able to kick somebody's ass about it. But um, <laughs> it's also fun to see the light bulb go on. And it's not to say that I don't learn things from them, too. You know, it's a two-way conversation. But the, we do have some resistance, I think, to, as a, as a community in general, uh, to looking at old ways of doing things. Yeah, and, and I think another one that we've talked about is design, thinking, confusing yourself with the, the user. Absolutely. <laughs> Designing for yourself. That's another Purple Moon story. You know, here I am designing games for little girls, and one of the series of games is called Secret Paths, and it's journeys into inner reality and fantasy and dreamland. And I had that thing of wanting to go take care of the animals, you know, and it was kind of like Secret Garden was my idea of how that ought to be. Um, and if I hadn't done the research, I would have just blown it so hardcore. You know? Every, it seemed like 90% of the girls we talked to wanted to be taken care of by animals and plants mm. and magical beings <laughs> in those spaces, for example. And, and, you know, part of that is the context shift. What movies did they see that, you know, did I see? the role of gender uh, and how we construct ourselves. Um, but it's that business of, oh, well, I was once a little girl, so I know what being a little girl is. Or I'm an adult, so I know what an adult is. Or I know some boys, so I know what boys are like. You know, um, That's a problem, and it's the first problem that design students face. And I think even now in my life, I find myself still doing it. I really have to step back and check myself and make sure I'm not making myself into the idealized user. Yeah, now we're, we're being challenged even more uh, because uh, gender fluidity has become, you know, front and center. And it's all very I, hip now. I can, well, I can attest as a parent of a transgender teen right. that, like, I've had to rethink the way I speak, my language, the, the you know, the, the identity yeah. of, of a person that's in my life every minute. And... And so I think that that sort of sort of thorough, you know, questioning of assumptions is, is really essential. Yeah. So let's talk about process. And yeah, capital P process. I'm not really usually enamored of rigid process. Mm -hmm. And in our practice, we do a lot of research. It's mostly for uh, information behavior. But um, uh, you know, I'm currently leading my team through, a, or, you know, an exercise to develop our process to make it more flexible but keep it rigorous at the same time. Yeah, you know, are there, are there some core principles or a framework, you know, that you can maybe suggest? Well, it's not going to sound surprising to anybody. I think it's more about the 
it's more about the way we approach the framework than the framework itself. Um, I mean, we start with this generative set of questions. There are the questions, or as I like to do, you know, phrases that that we know we're going to look for. Okay, what do these things have in common? What's in the middle of this little triangle? And you could come up with 37 different good answers to that. But it's a way to kickstart the process. We usually don't have the luxury of doing that. Um, I think that I would call that part finding the opportunity space. Um, and then secondary men, you know, do your secondary. When we were working with girls and games, there was secondary research in just about every field you could name that was relevant to that topic. Um, and secondary research can also include culture audits and market audits, and you all know all this stuff. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but using your secondary to help form up then what you're going to do in qualitative, human-centered research is a real key. In other words, what you got from your secondary is giving you a good idea of, of what to look at when you're actually talking to human beings. And in terms of uh, human-centered research, uh, it's, it's my finding, at least as a researcher, that focus groups are not worth shit. <laughs> <laughs> First of all. Thank so, you for saying Thank you. I use, the, I use one of those words that make people unhappy. Um, We're all adults. Especially with children, because, you know, the minute they figure out who's King Tut in the room, everybody's going to say the same thing. And they, Adults do this, too, even in party groups. So... Be suspicious of focus groups and party groups. Um, I think it's much better to do interviews in home than in facility. Uh, the facility is good for doing usability testing and stuff like that later on. Uh, but if you're going in somebody's home, you get to see what they eat for breakfast and what's in their refrigerator and what colors. They, you know, you get a lot more information than just the answers to some questions in your in your interview guide, right? I also think that dyads are really, really, really a good idea when you can do them. And by dyads, I mean you screen for one person and then you ask them to bring their best friend, for example. Or in the case of, of a former student of mine is now working in a, at Chase on, on a loan uh, approval, and they're doing dyads with husbands and wives because they're learning that these people have entirely different notions of what is going on with the same finances that they share, uh, and different ways of talking about it. Um, when you've got a kid with their best friend there, if, if that kid tells you a fib, their best friend is going to call them on it. You can be sure that will happen. Um, I had a girl in Indianapolis, she was all dressed up, real fussy, with lots of curls in her hair and bows and stuff. And, her friend was there, and we, I asked her if she if she considered herself athletic. This was we were working on a soccer title at the time. She said, "I'm not really. I I feel very feminine." And uh, and her friend says, "Yeah, and you're the top pitcher in the girls' little league in the city." You know, <laughs> I would not have found that out if her friend hadn't been there to out her on it. Another thing you can do that's really unethical is after the interview, hi to the ladies' room <laughs> and listen to these kids talk to their mom. <laughs> that is so unethical. I only did it once, but I learned a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. We'll forgive you. Sometime. So, yeah, and then you get into your analysis and synthesis pieces. And then it's time to go formative, really. So you're starting to do studio work and paper prototyping. If you have multiple teams working on the same research problem, you're going to allow some competition of ideas and hopefully get some convergence around it. And then it's a different ballgame. You know? And then the kind of research you're doing is really user testing, usability testing, um, beta testing, that kind of stuff. There's a big difference, by the way, between design research and market research. You all know this, right? Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I don't need to explain that to anybody. Well, I, maybe you should. Well, I think market research is really about how do we sell it, and design research is about what do we make, you know, in general. Um, 
And when market researchers come to you with product ideas and they want you to just go straight to usability testing or straight to prototype, you need to grab them gently by the hand and say, come with me here to speak with some members of our potential audience, not about your great idea, but just to find out some stuff about them. Um, and if you're working in a, a product company where there's constantly a rub between development and marketing, a really good thing to do is to take members of both of those teams to human-centered research interviews with you. So they can, so that when there's a disagreement, you can say, come with me now, back to the research that we did together, right? Y'all remember this, right? Oh, you don't? Well, I have a videotape, you know, so. So it stops a lot of fights. <laughs> I'm off script. <laughs> off script is good. So speaking of off, off script, a couple of questions that I, that aren't on the script. Uh, one is, you've been doing this longer than anybody, literally longer than anyone, I think. Um, and what? <laughs> that's a compliment. Um, so so. <laughs> what, how? What's the biggest change that you've seen over? over time. Time. <laughs> well, well, first the dinosaurs disappear. Uh, I deserve that. <laughs> I really think the disambiguation of market research and design research mm. is a big change. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember sitting on some market research at Procter & Gamble that they were trying to pass off as design research. So that's a big change. I think... Um, the elaboration on the skill of, of inventing and executing on good probes has really changed so that you can get lots of lots more information from probes as we get better at designing them and thinking strategically about how we're going to use them. You with me? Yeah. Okay. I think another thing that's changed a lot is how we represent our findings to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I mentioned one of one of my classes, um, the six-year-old boy group, made models of the boys' bedrooms uh, as an example of analysis that then could be queried to get to synthesis. So the toys in the room, the back wall represented heroes, the ceiling was aspirations. Over here we had a window to look outside. You know, there was a coded meaning to every part of the architecture, but then it was populated with stuff from a particular kid that we had interviewed. And that was incredibly helpful. And I, I can't imagine seeing that in the 70s. <laughs> right. And, and along those same lines, uh, we talk a lot about institutional resistance, and I think we've all been there. Do you feel like that? Do you feel like we've gotten more respect over the years? <laughs> it depends on the industry. It, yeah. You know, I mean, I'm sure that there's not institutional resistance anywhere like where there used to be in actual design firms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing just hardcore, till death do us part, institutional resistance in the financial and banking sectors. Really? Where these guys will fund the research and they'll go out there and do it and they'll do the synthesis and they will ignore it. Hmm. They will shelve it. They will put it away. So it's like, yeah, we did that part now. Let's go do Does that it. happen to anyone else here? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe these guys don't work for banks. Possibly. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, I'd like to close. I uh, thank everybody else, but I'd like to close by thanking you for thank being you, here. Bram. And and thank you for being uh, an inspiration and an avatar in my career. Aww. And uh, and I'm sure that most of the people in this room probably feel the same way. Well, thank you, Bram. So thank you. My nuclear vessel. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Yeah, let's we open have time it up. for Q and A. Yes. Yeah, I'm kind of curious. I think uh, kind of at one point you're talking about learning from the past, and I thought one of those issues is the talking within a field. Sometimes I don't look at other fields. And, uh, yeah. As a lay person, you've been interested in your work for a while. And I looked, it always seemed like you brought life into your work, and like these other aspects of life really in, in kind of inform like in those, your direction. So I'm kind of wondering, like some of those I can think of, I kind of know, is uh, kind of a little later on in life. Uh, are there kind of new influences from outside, you know, 
designed it and how you're thinking about the development of your work as a design researcher? Absolutely. Yeah. Grandchildren. Repeat it. Uh, how, how have influences on my life changed? On my yeah, it's just, it's that influences, it seems like, in your work from outside. Yeah, life from in outside. General, yeah. Design research work. So, what are some of the ones that have come up more recently that are like, you feel like shaping and forming how you're working? Yeah, grandchildren, politics, civility, climate change, uh, the disappearance of science in some ways from early learning, yeah. at least in ways that it can be understood, um, lack of engagement with the natural world among our school children, cutbacks in the arts funding in schools. You know, all these things are part of the shifting ground of our culture, and, and they, they make me feel a little more urgent, I guess, about of uh, uh, some of the approaches that I take. How does it show up though in the work, right? That's influencing it, like, like for example, like theater and improv, like influencing your actions. Oh, I see what you're saying. Research. So, uh, so you're, you're asking more about stuff I do that influences me? Well, like, we've kind of talked about design research, and we're like, oh, well, what, like, what's your approach and how we can learn, like, from that? And it's like wondering what's kind of, like, the bias box is one thing, but, like, I'll just repeat what I said before. I, as I grow older, I have an increasing sense of stoicism and responsibility to model the good. Um, and doing the good seems more urgent to me than it ever has. I'm sorry, I can't be. No, no. Yeah. I'm going to actually uh, bring the mic around. Or I'm going to protect myself. You know something else I'll answer you with? I, I've become an abalone diver. And I've become a kayaker and an underwater photographer in the last 30 years of my life, and that's changed my outlook on a lot of things and the pace at which I do them. So just building on that, you said about perspective, and I captured the three little words that you talked about. I thought that was very interesting because that brings an element of perspective in the research that you're doing. And I wonder if those three little words are purely random Two little words are purely random because the third one is a rock. Or is it informed intuition behind that? It's, uh, yeah, I, I confess, you know, I, I rigged it. Um, <laughs> it's fake news. No. Um, <laughs> so after 9 11, energy came up right away for me. And then I puzzled around with, you know, what would those other words be to give to my students as a framework for investigation. So I tried to look for uh, things that were timely. Um, so, for example, I became aware from just knowing some little boys that they were getting really different messages from the media than from their parents about what it meant to be a boy. And so that one came out of just stuff I was absorbing. Uh, and how it just seemed to me like little boys were getting neglected in all of our hurry to help little girls. I guess I was doing my guilt pay for having you know, made Purple Moon happen, but um, yeah. So I tried to be timely. Um, and I got help from other teachers and students sometimes as well. Sometimes you just look at a demographic, right? You just look at an underserved demographic, like elders in institutional care, right? And, and the words will show up for you. Sure. So I'm intrigued by um, the, the conversation around the, the ethics and our responsibility, our values as like, human-centered designers and researchers. And when I think about when we try to learn and go and gather data and information about our subjects, um, there are systems where there is a lot of data. There is a lot of questionably sourced data. Yeah. What is our responsibility as kind of human-centered practitioners when dealing with organizations, our own organizations, that may have data and asking us to take advantage of data that is a kind of questionable um, collection? Oh, <laughs> or, or the, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the respect 
uh, for the audience when collecting that data, but then we're being asked to utilize that. And it's a rich trove, but it makes you feel a little dirty. <laughs> Well, if it's anonymized, it's not as bad as it could be, right? Um, but I take your point, and I think everybody has a line that they need to draw around what's good ethical practice. This is uh, as opposed to like being having ethics as a concern when you are designing stuff is one thing. Having an ethical practice as a researcher is another. And if you're getting, you know, Tom Sawyer into using data that you don't feel comfortable with, then you got two choices, right? You're going to call it out, or you're going to feel guilty for the rest of your life. So you might as well call it out. Um, or at least find ways that you might sort through that, those data to figure out if any of it's kosher. And you can use a subset of it. But that would be my opinion. Easy for me to say. You know, I'm retired. <laughs> yes. It's the man in the back there in the blue shirt. Yeah, Nazarian, I think. He's Armenian. Brenda, can you give us any pointers on asking great questions? <laughs> I think they need to be open ended, obviously. You want to. If you can, induce someone to tell you a story of sorts. Um, you don't want to go right, you don't want to say, so would you like it if your game had blue uniforms? You know, that's too specific, it's not useful. Um, imagine for me your favorite sports team. How would they look? Is a better way to ask that question? because you'll get a bunch more answers than just the colors of the uniforms. Um, can you remember a time when is a good kind of question because it gets a person into telling you a story. Um, it's good not to ask superlative questions like, what is your favorite? What is the worst? What's the unhappiest day of your life? You know, those kinds of mostest questions cause people to self-censor too much. Better to say, can you remember a day when you, you kind of felt really bad about yourself? Do you mind telling me about that? You know, that that gets you in the door in a different way. Does that help? Is that answering your question in part? Also, I think getting people to draw, you know, can you draw me a picture of your playground? I've used that in researching four different demographics for four different reasons, and it's always helpful because you will see that, you know, some children are person-centric and some are architecture-centric and some are activity-centric, and you can start to see how that segments um, by gender, by age. Um, so drawing is great because it's open-ended, and then you can ask your, your interviewee to reflect on what they drew, walk you through Oh, yeah. Let me see if I can figure a story here. Um, you touched a little bit on, the, on what has changed, right? Like the difference between market research and user research. And I'm curious, you know, 30 years ago when you were starting to do the VR interaction studies. I had, I think we all knew that we were crash dummies in the early days because it was just too expensive. And once it became clear to me that we had neither the cycles nor the affordances for throughput uh, to, to make this into an amusement park game even, that um, we were going to have to wait a while. So those of us who were working in those days were really doing it for research more than actually making stuff that we thought we could sell or get in front of a lot of people. Um, does, does that kind of answer your question? I, I was really disappointed, I must say, that games jumped to the head of the line with the resurgence because, man, in the, in the days that I was working at least, at least half of the designers were women. And most of us had art on our minds, you know? Um, so it, it, it was a very different scene. And I must say there's the East Coast, West Coast part too where, let me not, let me not totalize the coasts, 
there was a lot of thinking about VR for training. Um, but especially in San Francisco, there was a lot of thinking about VR as a kind of an acid trip, psychedelic moment. And I think that really colored what people were doing in those days. And I find it interesting that the guys who are designing today's VR may be microdosing LSD for depression, but you know, it's <laughs> not the same. <laughs> so it, it hasn't, I don't think I had a notion of how it would turn out. I just hoped it would become something that was pervasive and available enough that we could keep playing with it. Okay. Can you hear me? Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Oh my goodness, that's a really big question. Um, so I think you need to get a picture of what delights people within the context that you're doing, you know, you're doing your research in. So, for example, uh, when we were looking at energy entitlement and brand, the students observed that something delightful about hybrid cars, which were brand new in those days, was that they didn't make noise. Isn't that wild? I mean, and that became like a central value proposition to a, a transmedia system that those students designed to encourage the adoption of hybrid vehicles. Um, so sometimes it's discovering what already delights people. If it's making something DIY, you know, if, if they really like to go to the movies versus playing a board game, you know, preferences and in, in things that they enjoy doing already. People who knit are likely to become better programmers, although I am the exception. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think a lot of it is in, in making sure that your interview guide includes questions that can give you a, a window into what really makes this person happy. Also, you got to you got to understand. Well, so great example: the hula hoop, right? 1957. The guy who designed the hula hoop did not go out and say what would you guys like? Would you like a piece of plastic you could rotate around your hips, right? <laughs> How about that? How would that work for you? No, he was looking at clapping games among girls. He was, working at, he was looking at the craze of hula dancing among teenagers and women. Um, and he was looking at the changes in popular dance styles and extrapolating from those. And then when he made the piece of plastic, everybody said, wow, this is great. I would have never thought of this, you know. Uh, but he was taking delights from other sources and kind of combining those and making a synthesis that gave him the idea for the hula Well, on that note, thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Artifact. Thank you, Artifact. And thank you.